Hello everyone. My name is Heather and I'm one of the specialist nurses working at Prostate Cancer UK. And it is lovely to be here with you all this evening. I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes as more people are joining before I uh, I start. You can see that the the numbers are trickling up as I'm speaking. So I'll just give it a minute before um we begin. There's quite a few of you on um on the webinar now at the moment. I know that um you guys attending you can't see um the numbers um and, and you won't be um visible or we won't be able to hear you throughout this webinar. I'll just give it another minute and just see if we have any more attendees join and then I'll start. So I will, um, I think I'll kick off now with quite a few of you here and it's just coming up to um, two or three minutes past seven and um, anyone else who joins us along the way, uh, that'd be brilliant. So I've worked for the charity for almost five years and as I say, it's lovely to be here with you this evening. We'd like to use this opportunity to explain prostate cancer risk factors and identify the barriers that often prevent men at risk from seeing their GP. So I think I'll just pop into a bit of housekeeping. So as I said, the webinar is being recorded, but those of you attending, we cannot see you or, or you can't be heard. Um, please ask any questions you have throughout the webinar in the Q&A box, and we'll be answering as many of these as we can possibly um, live at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar uh, and we'll come to them at the end. Please don't share any personal health information. If you wish to discuss anything specific or about you or, or, or somebody else's health condition, please call my team, the specialist nurses, and we'll be able to help it in more detail or, or get in touch with your own hospital team. Our contact details will be shared a little bit uh, later. Um, let's see, we'll go down along. If you just... I'm just going to have a brief run through of today's webinar itinerary. So firstly, we will be joined by Prostate Cancer UK's Amy Rylance to outline key prostate cancer risk factors and the results of our recent overcoming barriers research to help improve early diagnosis. After that, we'll be chatting to Dr. Bunmi Olajede and Samuel Nelson, a man with lived experience who'll be sharing their real life experiences to help men overcome these barriers. Following this, we'll be hearing from um, Prostate Cancer UK volunteer Ian Bell, who'll be giving tips and sharing his experiences of how to have life-saving conversations with others in your communities. And finally, as I said, we will finish with a Q&A and just another reminder to submit those questions in the Q&A box throughout and we'll carry out the Q&A session at the end. Um, so just to begin, I would like to welcome Amy Rylance, Prostate Cancer UK's Assistant Director of Health Improvement, who will be explaining prostate cancer risk factors and outlining some of the research um, of, of some of the barriers research. Um, over to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, lovely to be with you this evening. And as Heather says, I'm here to talk about who's at risk and also what we know about the barriers that stop men getting an early diagnosis. So 
Bit of big picture first. We know that prostate cancer is really common. It affects one in eight men in the UK. And what we're really concerned about is that every year there are 10,000 men who get diagnosed too late for a cure. And so what we really want to get to a point is where prostate cancer can do no harm. And in order to achieve that, we need to find all of these men earlier when treatment is easier. So let's deep dive into, well, who is at risk of prostate cancer? And it starts with age. So we know that your risk increases as you get older. And for most men, we talk about your risk going up from the age of 50, and it gets higher as you get older. But there are some groups of men for whom the risk is even higher. So if you are black, then your risk is actually double. So one in four black men will get prostate cancer in their lifetime. And nobody knows exactly why that is. What we do know is that there is no evidence, there's lifestyle factors that cause that. The best evidence that we have is that that is caused by genetics. So fact, things that you inherit from your parents, and that leads us into the other group who we know are at significantly higher risk of prostate cancer. And that's men with a family history of prostate cancer. So by that, we mean that if your dad or your brother has had prostate cancer, then your risk is double or higher. Because actually, if you have more family members who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, or if your family members have been diagnosed particularly young, or with particularly aggressive disease, all of those things increase your personal risk of prostate cancer. And while we talk about family history, I want to just briefly mention BRCA. So BRCA is a gene that we all have, and some people have a variation in that gene. And we most people know about the BRCA gene in terms of breast cancer. It actually stands for BRCA, actually stands for breast cancer. It was first discovered as a gene change that could increase the risk of breast cancer. But what we know now is that it can also increase men's risk of prostate cancer. And so if you have a significant family history of breast or ovarian cancer, or if you know that BRCA gene variations run in your family, then that also increases your risk of prostate cancer. And for all of these men, what we want for them is an early diagnosis. So if they do get prostate cancer, we find it early when treatment is much easier. And one of the things that we know from our conversations with men is that we all kind of believe that if we had a serious illness, if we had cancer, we'd know about that. We'd feel something in our bodies that would tell us that there was something wrong. But what makes prostate cancer really tricky is that often in those early stages, there actually aren't any symptoms. So the key thing to know is that whether or not you have symptoms, check your risk. And to make that really easy, Prostate Cancer UK developed its online risk checker. So the QR code here or the URL will take you to our online risk checker. Um, you can answer a few quick questions and it will give you some information about your risk and crucially what you can do about it. But I said today that we were gonna also talk about barriers. So what we were interested in is, well, what are the things that stop men from taking action on the base of risk? What are the things that mean that people don't go and speak to their GP? And so we did a couple of really big pieces of market research. We spoke to thousands of men at high risk of prostate cancer to really unpick and understand well, what, what acts as a barrier to taking action. And the first thing, the elephant in the room, the belief that the usual check for prostate cancer is a finger up the backside. Now, this was the biggest barrier that we came across. It was the most commonly held belief and it was the most likely to stop people from wanting to speak to their GP. And that's really problematic because actually what we know now is that the rectal examination is not a very good test for prostate cancer. 
So if you have a test that isn't great at finding prostate cancer, but is really good at putting men off from speaking to their GP, that's a big problem. And so when we look at our messaging, what we're going to be saying more and more is the best test is a quick and easy blood test you can get for free from your GP. You don't have to have a rectal exam. The next barrier I want to touch on is around symptoms. So I said we spoke to a lot of men aged over 50. And when we spoke to those over a thousand men, half of them said, I've noticed changes in how I pee as I get older. Now, some of you will know that that's the kind of thing that we talk about as being a possible symptom of prostate cancer. But clearly, half of all men over the age of 50 don't have prostate cancer. It's a really common thing that changes as you get older. And the problem with that is that we used to have lots of messaging where we said early prostate cancer usually doesn't have symptoms. Now, if you hear that and you think, well, hang on, I think I've got some symptoms. Does that mean that we create fear and anxiety that you might have left it too late? And what we know when it comes to health actions is that fear is not a good motivator. Fear paralyzes people. It stops them from taking action. So you will have heard me say this earlier, our messaging is whether or not you have symptoms, check your risk. And finally, just picking up on the point I just made, using fear about leaving cancers too late drives anxiety and avoidance. It doesn't make people take action. And so the key message that we're going to be using a lot is the earlier you find it, the easier it is to treat. It's true but it's also much more motivating than trying to scare people about the prospect of leaving it too late. And we've taken all of this messaging, we've built it into our first ever TV adverts that are designed to drive awareness. So this picture here is, is the baby Layla who features in one of our TV adverts. Um, and they're really about driving home the message that the earlier you find prostate cancer, the easier it is to treat and we'll be posting some links in the chat um, to those TV adverts so that you can have a look at them, share them around your networks. But I'm gonna wrap up there and pass back to Heather. Thank you so much, Amy. That is a fantastic session. And Going forward, I'm going to welcome um, Bonmi uh, Olojede and Samuel Nelson. And I'll leave it over to you to introduce yourselves. Well, good evening. My name is Samuel Nelson. Um, glad to be here with you. Was uh, someone who had a disease. Um, went through treatment, good treatment, good advice, and I'm here to try and support as much as I can. Thank you. Yeah, um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Bumi. I'm a GP um, in the Greater London area, Romford, to be specific. Um, got an interest um, over the years um, in cancer, and more so in the past... Uh, three years, prostate cancer specifically. So I'm involved in a lot of work um, with reaching kind of had, had to reach groups, if I put it that way, um, and raising awareness around prostate cancer and early presentation in men. Thank you. And, and, and thank you both so much for joining us. Um, so we know that Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men, but it's also one of the most survivable cancers there is if you find it at an earlier stage. And as Amy just said, the earlier you find it, the easier it is to treat. But obviously fear is enormously common and does all too often prevent or delay men who are at risk going to their GP. Hopefully the content of today's webinar will help alleviate some of those fears. 
Samuel, obviously this fear has been all too real for you. How did you handle it? And, and do you have any advice for men considering consulting their GP or encouraging others at risk to do so? Yes. Um, and firstly, can I just say, Dr. Um, Fumi, I'm from Rumford as well. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Rush Green. I live in Rush Green. Rush Green. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so my kind of introduction to the to prostate cancer rely, revolves around my father, who in, um, was, uh, he, 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 he did not talk to us about his illness. We didn't know he was ill. Um, I remember the first time we knew about his illness is after we buried him. We were told that it was prostate cancer. Um, and then we were, because he had five sons, we were told that then you also need to start um, looking after yourself. So I just went off and got tested. Just got tested. And it was perfectly fine. There was nothing wrong. But the doctor said, why don't you do a six-month? Um, um, test every six months and I, I continued for, for years doing that six months um, and and then suddenly in 2017 16, 17 um, my PSA went up for no apparent reason, just went up Right, it, it was just one of those days I went for the test and there I was PSA went up and the doctor said come back in three months let's just check and so I went away, came back in three months, and it was up a little bit more. And it progressively over, rather than months, it was like weeks. It just keep growing, growing, growing. And then so we, we decided to opt for action. But if I wasn't aware, and if I wasn't doing the test, as some people alluded earlier, is that I didn't have a symptom. He wasn't. I didn't have an issue that I had to go and see the GP relating to anything to do with um, prostate or anything like that. I didn't know. It's just that because I was in the that significant figure, uh, I thought, let me just get on doing my test. And it was that early diagnosis that really helped me as well. So I would, I would say to people, yes, um, we can discuss some of the fears, but a PSA test these days is, is what, 10 minutes, if that? <laughs> and it's very simple. And it's the beginning of the process as well, actually. And many times you'll find that that's enough to, mm -hmm. to, to allay any fears. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it, it worked for you, Samuel. You know, it, worked, the... it worked for me. Worked for me. Yeah. And, and Bonmi, what advice do you have from a, a GP's perspective? Well, the first thing I'd, I'd say is um, it's it's not unusual um, that we it, that we are, and I use we because even as as healthcare professionals, we are patients also. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not unusual, and definitely not uncommon in my practice um, to uh, to be afraid um, or have some anxieties around going to see a healthcare professional or a doctor, especially GPs. And that could be born from quite a number of factors. Um, and, and part of it is, I think, Samuel touched on kind of getting to know after his dad's death. So for some people, that could trigger a kind of experience around, oh, if I'm going to see a doctor, it, it might just be bad news or every mm. time I go see the doctor mm. it could be bad news um there could be just that fear of the unknown what is the outcome going to be um so first thing is to say it's not uncommon um and um it's just encouraging patients to say that shouldn't really be a barrier um we as GPS would want patients to come forward. Um, and in any way, they could get that to happen. Um, so even if it's coming with somebody or for those men that really want to kind of 
keep it personal uh, to themselves, um, even if that initial consultation is kind of keeping it open with the with, with the GP and just straight and open to say, you know, I don't like seeing the doctors and I've just had to come here today because that then preps the, the GP um, or the clinician. So they're, they're more kind of um, come up more inviting in, in mm. that way and, and can have a, a better consultation with the patient, a, a better rapport with the patient. So um, please, please don't, don't let it be a barrier. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and thank you both so much um, for that. And and we know that another barrier, you know, that we talked that Amy mentioned that we, we speak about as well is, is symptoms. And, and what is key is whether you have any symptoms or not, how important it is to find out about your risk. And if you are in the, the higher risk category, you're thinking about having those conversations about the PSA blood test with your GP. And I think, um, you know, uh, Samuel mentioned you, you didn't have symptoms, I think, you know, is, is what he said um, just a bit earlier. I th I think Samuel might have dropped out of the call maybe just temporarily, but I'm sure he'll be back to join us. Um, but me, in your experience, how often do you see people, you know, patients with symptoms in in, in your practice? Um, yeah, I, I think the, the simple answer is um, not always. Mm. Okay, not, not always. Um, and um, especially now that there's so much awareness around prostate cancer being raised and a, a lot of work being done by a lot of charities. Um, obviously, Prostate Cancer UK also been a, a, one of the major ones. Um, you, you, you get men just coming now, just either because their wife has asked them or their mom or their sisters or their brother, um, just to say, I want to check. And more like Samuel, no symptoms whatsoever um obviously well, um there have been kind of events that over the years where it's either a celebrity that's been either diagnosed with prostate cancer or, or even an issue with the prostate not necessarily prostate cancer so example the king and i know how many patients i had walking just to say do you know what i want to have a psa test uh, um so um Yes, it's not every time that we get symptoms and that there have been instances where the patient just comes in for something different and discussions uh, have just triggered a need to raise awareness in those patients. So they, they could be talking about something else and go, oh, my brother's had prostate cancer or my dad. And then you're like, how old are you? Mm have you ever heard about the PSA test? And, and then go, no, and, and then you do the test and it might come back actually showing that they've got prostate cancer. So it's not every time that there are symptoms. Yeah, yeah. And, and just like you say, it's, it's about using the opportunities, you know, that it, it, even if it is a chat about something totally different, if it kind of comes back around to that, you know, it, it, it's great. Um, we're going to move on and talk a little bit about the DRE. Um, or the digital rectal exam. So around half of men or 46% believe that they would need a, a rectal exam um, or the finger up the bum to get tested for prostate cancer. But new research says, as Amy was mentioning, that it's no longer a useful test for prostate cancer. Bumi, can you explain in, in more detail why the DRE is no longer a useful test for, for prostate cancer diagnosis? Um. Yeah, that, uh, thanks, Ella. It's, uh, well, what we know now is there is more to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. This, we, the main game changer is the MRI scanning. However, the PSA test on its own. So if you kind of take a, a general sample of all men that had the diagnosis of prostate cancer, they have had a PSA test. So um, though it's not a screening test, mm. men, and again, I'll go back to Samuel, he talked about having that test. 
if not for the PSA, he wouldn't have known. So the PSA test, definitely. And now we've got the MRI scans. Now, why I touched on the MRI scan is um, it used to be in the past where you have a PSA test and then the doctor will have to put the finger of the bomb to try and feel the prostate gland. Mm -hmm. And um, either it feels normal or abnormal, if the PSA is raised, you're still sent to the hospital and then you have biopsies. Um, and then at the hospital, they do the, the, mm. the, the rectal uh, kind of digital rectal examination also. Um, now it's a PSA test. If it's raised anyway, the, the digital rectal examination is known. It's not a useful, it's not a good indicator in men when you're talking prostate cancer. So if the question then goes to, is it absolutely needed? Um, the answer is no, it's not uh, an absolutely needed test. Um, but yeah, with a, 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 a raised PSA, it, it's an MRI scan. And that usually um, would tell us if, if there is something or, or not in the, in the prostate. So um, definitely the evidence now is showing that you, you, you do not need to do a digital rectal examination. One thing I would touch on also is, again, in the past, um, because findings have shown that a lot of the uh, prostate cancers are found kind of more towards the um, posterior area, mm -hmm. um, that once you do a, a rectal examination, you can feel around it. But we know, again, no, uh, you would have um, prostate cancer occur anywhere within the gland um, and uh, even as a professional at times it might be so difficult to feel the prostate gland or interpret what you're, you're feeling in the gland so uh, again that points to it's not really a reliable test here. Yeah and, and I think we hear time and time again you know that people are discouraged you know when they hear about that test and so it is great that we have this research now to back it up as well you know um thanks so much Bunmi. and just to you um samuel how how was your prostate cancer diagnosed uh, so as i said um it was one of those six monthly um, yeah appointment and i i was actually living away in the middle east and i was traveling back to the uk and I thought, let me just get the check, mm. <laughs> say the July before I left. And um, so I just went for the normal one. And the doctor was, uh, he said, oh, Mr. Nelson, your um, PSA has increased a little from two point something to three point something, I think it was. Mm. And he said, oh, it could be, it could be an infection. Go away, have your summer, come back. And so I said, you know, so I went back. And in uh, around October, I went back for another PSA and it had increased another degree. And so we did it again in another month and it then went off. And then it, eventually it was about six point something. And that's when he started to talk about the kind of actions that we need to take. Yeah, to get to get the diagnosis, isn't that it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so we, he then sent me off to a colleague in the hospital who then went through and confirmed that indeed it was 10% cancerous and and then started to talk about the kind of treatment that I need to take, you know. But I think the point, and we have to keep pushing this point home, is that you must check. And as the doctor says, it's a PSA initially. Check your PSA. Go see your GP. Check your PSA. It's a blood test, and it can save you a lot of bother because the earlier, earlier, this uh, you are diagnosed, is the better options you have. So I had all the options in the world. You know, the doctor sat me and my wife down and he spoke to us about it, and he said, "Look, you know, it's not something that is going to rapidly grow." You can take your time, you can treat it this way, you can treat it that way, you can treat it that way, you can treat it that way. I took the, the drastic op option because of 
one that my dad had passed away from it. My sister died of um, another cancer, which was unrelated, but it's cancer. And I just decided, look, if the cancer is contained in the prostate itself and not affected any other cavity of the body, then I'm going to risk <laughs> on the drastic removal. Um, but it doesn't have to get to that. You know, and so I'm saying what I would say to and I'm saying to colleagues is that, look, one early diagnosis is the best option. And if indeed it's a cancer, then you have more options to treat it the earlier you caught it. I could have walked around. Say, for example, I wasn't going for those month, six monthly um, options. Hmm. I could have been walking around today not knowing that I have mm. prostate cancer, right? And then I would have gone, I would have probably feel healed sometimes or whatever. And then I would have gone to the doctor and it would have been kind of too late <laughs> because maybe by that time, say for example, it was 10% way back in 2017. It's now 2024. I don't know how much it could have grown in that space of time. Um, and then my options would, be, would have been narrower I think mm. if I didn't take the action into it. So I would advise men, go. Um, there is enough information now. Back in the day when I was doing this, there was none of this information, none of this um, Zoom meetings. And, and mm. I didn't know of prostate cancer until I kind of started delving in. But now it's it's there, it's involved. Mm. There's the GP talking about. It. There's GPs yeah. inviting yeah. people to come in. So yeah, yeah. And and just on that, Samuel, it was two thousand and seventeen. Did did mm. you was your diagnosis? Um, did did it go from PSA blood test to biopsy, or did you have an MRI scan before your biopsy? So in in two thousand and seventeen, in the Middle East, it was um, I didn't have an MRI scan actually. It was PSA and a biopsy. Yeah. When it was confirmed through the biopsy, that is ten percent cancerous. Yeah. And so the options were given and I took the one that I felt was right for me. Yeah. And mm. and the thing is about that is that, you know, the kind of even even to add to that, you know, is that we have MPMRI now in the diagnostic pathway. Exactly. And to help avoid, you know, a situation where maybe somebody might have an unnecessary biopsy. We know now that generally an a raised PSA will generally lead to an MRI scan and, and not biopsy. Not, not, not that the, anything was wrong when in your situation, but, you know, things have moved on and the research tells us that's the best way yeah. to use MPMRI in, in this case. Exactly. And we're going to have, oh, sorry, we're, we're going to have some information shared about those tests that are used in the, in the cancer diagnosis shared in the, in the chat now, um, talking about what you just did um samuel about the biopsies but also about the the mp mri as well yes and you know because what you just mentioned and because we're talking about diagnosis you know this of course brings up uh, the subject of the lack of screening programs for prostate cancer patients something that comes up a lot and, and something i speak about a lot in, in my job as a specialist nurse for prostate cancer uk so research would suggest that 42% of men think that it's up to do up to their GP to tell them if they need to do about uh, what they need to do about prostate cancer. But right now, you know, there is no routine screening program and men need to find out about their risk themselves, which you just mentioned, Samuel, you know, there is a lot of information out there, but it's still important that we kind of get that information out, explain as much as we can about how risk really, really matters in prostate cancer. So naturally, this would make men worry, you know, and wonder, you know, if I need a test, why wouldn't the the health provider or the health services tell me so? Just to you, you know, on that kind of topic, Bunny, why would you encourage men to take the initiative and to see their GP themselves? Uh, I think it's just been put brilliantly by Amy with the slides and Samuel. Um, it's that beat and I, I think that's that message being pushed by PCUK is really important and it's that bit around the earlier um, um, kind of the, the earlier it's picked up then the easier it is to to treat um, and, and Samuel's kind of elaborated on that when he mentioned 
more options and we know the options now even vary um, from either treatment to no treatment or, or just kind of put in simple terms monitoring where the hospital follows the person um so that, that, that i think that's the message that's the simple message and the simple answer there the earlier um, the easier it is to treat Thank you so much. And, um, you know, while the the PSA blood test on its own it isn't a suitable tool to use in a screening program uh, for prostate cancers, we know that researchers are working to find a tool or a test or a combination of tests that might be suitable in the future. And it's because of, of this that Prostate Cancer UK are leading the way in this space by uh, launching the TRANSFORM trial, the biggest prostate cancer screening trial for 20 years. And TRANSFORM aims to find the best way to screen men for prostate cancer and hopes to double the, the number of lives saved. There's going to be a link shared in the chat now, um, a little more information on that TRANSFORM trial. And while the potential results of TRANSFORM make us incredibly hopeful you know, for the future, it, it will take several years for us to accurately gather that data. So in, in, in the meantime, it is really vital that men who are at increased risk of prostate cancer visit their GP and, and make an informed decision um, about their option, you know. Um, I, I would also suggest um, that part of the process, I think, is to begin to probably write to households. I, so when I remember a few years ago, my wife would receive um, an annual letter from her GP for breast screening, something like that. Recently, it's, it was bowel cancer, you know, the information is coming out. And I think prostate cancer needs to get to that level where the, the medical system informs us, make it more, break down that barrier by sending a letter so that someone else is caring about this, not just the onus is left to me to go and see my GP and, and, talk, and talk about it. But, you know, I, I believe there should be a process, an official process where, like the transform, and I think that's the, 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 the way that transform is going, where it should be a, 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 um, a, a, a letter, something to men to say, look, you know, go and check. So you wouldn't just be left to men and the wives are. You know, it's a general process. And I think that's what we're looking for, a screening process. For you. Yeah. Yeah. And and hopefully we're going to see a lot from Transform. You know, it's, it's yeah. quite an, it's a it's a it's a good time for prostate cancer uh, right now. There's a lot of research going into it and, and hopefully we're going to see some improvements. Um, I'm going to move now to speak to um, our Prostate Cancer UK volunteer, Ian Bell, just to give some tips um, on having life-saving conversations. If it's okay that I hand over to you, Ian. Yes, hello, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ian Bell and I'm a volunteer with Prostate Cancer UK. I'm gonna talk this evening about a fresh approach to conversations about prostate cancer, and it's called Life-Saving Conversations. Life-Saving Conversations is a new way to spread awareness of prostate cancer quickly and to lots of people, both men and women. You may ask, why women? Uh, well, women are very good at getting the men in their lives to take action, especially when it comes to medical matters. How it works is that we will give you the knowledge the tools and the confidence to talk about prostate cancer to other people. It works by you speaking to 10 people, each of those 10 people then having a life conversation with another 10 people and so on. And soon we will have thousands of people talking about prostate cancer, the risks and what we should do about it across the country. This is especially important in areas uh, where the, um, <coughs> sorry, where, it, Sorry, uh, very important in areas where the uh, individuals are suffering from inequality and they uh, find it difficult to access uh, medical help. Eventually, we hope to make sure all at risk 
uh, prostate cancer uh, are, are approached and, and, and are helped to affect uh, a, a reduction in, in prostate cancer. Sorry. I can make an illustration of this from personal experience. I had a chance conversation many years ago with a colleague at work. He was having problems with his prostate, though fortunately it turned out not to be uh, prostate cancer. And that conversation stayed in the back of my mind until in 2016, in the spring, I went to see my GP about some completely unrelated item. Uh, I, I don't even know what it was at the time. But while I was there, this conversation perked up and came to the front of my mind. And I mentioned it to, to my GP while I was there. Uh, and he said, well, being 60 in your mid 60s, it might be a good idea if we uh, send you for a PSA blood test. As you've already heard, PSA uh, is a prostate a specific antigen. So protein found in the blood and acts as a very good indicator as to what uh, the risks might be and what problems there might be with the prostate. Anyway, I duly went along and had my uh, blood test. And then several days later, I had a phone call in the afternoon at about four o'clock uh, from my doctor, something in those pre-COVID days, which was pretty rare. Uh, and he said, I need to see you uh, by close of surgery today because um, I need to discuss some things with you. So I duly went along and he didn't beat about the bush. He uh, said quite simply that your PSA is very high uh, and you almost certainly have prostate cancer. So he sent me on a fast track uh, for further tests. Again, you've already heard about them. Uh, the MRI scan was the first one I went on. Um, this isolates well, it shows where the prostate is. And that leads that when they end up having, having the, uh, the biopsy, they know where to take the uh, samples from. Uh, this then will help them decide and confirm that it definitely is cancer, but also how aggressive the cancer is. And that will inform what treatment you end up having. I quickly found myself on hormone therapy. Uh, this was followed by four weeks of radiotherapy. And then the hormone therapy continued into the middle of 2018. Uh, since then, I've not had uh, any further treatment. Uh, I do have a six monthly uh, PSA test, and I'm still here to tell the tale. I think it's important that we go forward from here and try to spread the word to make sure that we don't leave any man behind. Uh, it's very critical that uh, the initiative is taken by us and hopefully this, uh, by this, this um, webinar will have um, inspired everyone to go on and have those life-saving conversations. When having life-saving conversations is quite a good idea, I think, to keep it uh, fairly casual, uh, fairly low-key, not to worry too much about specific details and statistics. The important outcome is that we get men to take action. And that action can be one of three things. Firstly, we already heard about the risk checker. This is an online tool that can be accessed through our website. Uh, or indeed speak to one of the prostate cancer nurses like Heather. Uh, and from personal experience, again, I can tell you how reassuring this can be. We need to go on now and spread the word. We have no time to lose because it's, it's important that the, the faster we spread this word, uh, the sooner we can reach our goal that no man dies of prostate cancer in the future. If you want to know more about this, uh, there's another webinar uh, which is being held by our volunteers on the 25th of July. And you can find out more about that from our website. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, sorry about the little hiccups, but uh, I'd like to hand it back now to Heather. Thank you, um, Ian. So fantastic to hear your story and just to hear about these conversations as well. And um, and as you say, if anyone wants to hear more, there is some information in the chat now as well. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A now. Um, if, if you'd like to hear more about Prostate Cancer UK's work in general and you're not already, you can sign up to our cause journey um, in the link in the chat um, where you can find out more about us. So I'm just going to see a question here. Um, okay, so this question may be um, for the panel, but potentially for but me. What do you do when you can't see or get a, a doctor's appointment? Yeah, thanks, Ed. Uh, um, <laughs> um, I, I get uh, this question a lot. I'm not 
not only for patients who are concerned about the prostate, but generally. Um, I think first it's it's kind of just understanding that the, the setup with the practice, so locally, and, and uh, being aware of which appointment systems are available uh, or appointment pathways are available to the patient. Um, so yes, um, there is the call through to the surgery and get an appointment, um, but there are in some cases, so patients might have not been able to get an appointment with the GP or state if not, but then there is the online uh, option, which kind of hasn't been explored. Uh, um, and as a GP that also work a lot with inequalities, I know in certain settings that could be difficult, elderly patients that, or patients that are not IT survey, but if um, they can uh, speak to a relative or the relative booking the appointment can be able to then go online, that would be great. Also, um, definitely a lot of GP areas now, there is what we call the hubs, um, GP hubs. Um, so it's it's an out of our service, but it's not just for emergencies. So they will do what you would expect to be done at your actual GP surgery um, and that's another option to explore so i think the bottom line is generally um not giving up you know it's that tendency to say oh, uh, i've tried and tried and i just want to give up please don't give up check those other options and finally if by chance you get through to the gp and and they go the next appointment is in two or three weeks please don't hang up and say no. Um, so you can wait that two to three weeks and keep that appointment and, and then speak to someone. Yeah. Thanks um, so much, Bunmi. It's something we we um, get asked about quite a lot is, is people um, wondering about GP appointments like you mentioned. Um, I think just in, in follow up to that, um, because we know that the, the appointment is generally to talk about the PSA test really, you know, there is a question here, which is, why is it in that some GPs appear to be fairly dismissive about the PSA test, saying that it is unreliable and potentially misleading? What, what is the most motivation? Is it genuine best interest of the patient or is having less PSA tests to do a cost saving exercise? Um, yeah, but, uh, first, and as a GP, I would want to apologize really <laughs> on how BF as a community. Um, the, the guidelines um, over um, uh, around PSA testing uh, is one thing to look at. And PC have been doing quite a lot uh, to, uh, to kind of get some changes with regards to guidelines um, because as we said, things have changed now. We've got the MRI scan. We, yes, it, it used to only be the PSA test, but now we've got the MRI scan. And we're seeing evidence from other areas also. So um, there is the push to visit the guidelines. So for some GPs, it's just the guideline says this age and I wouldn't change. Um, what's also happened is there's a lot of awareness being raised about risk factors. So the game changer is the risk factors. Um, and for men who have those risk factors, a family history, prostate cancer, um, black ethnic minority group, or they've got the BRCA gene, um, really they should be having a test. You, you, you should be checking them. So it's, the, it's keeping those discussions open um, the, the bottom line is the choice is the patients. If, if the patient's coming in saying, I want this test, um, what the GP should be doing is generally, okay, what do you know about the PSA test? And if it's a patient, I'll tell you my practice, who tells me, do you know what? I've gone on the risk checker and it's this. They, they, a lot of times they actually know <laughs> a lot about the PSA test. And it's like, oh, that's it. That's enough for me. And I think for a lot of GPs now, that's enough. So you're just wanting to be sure that the patients are aware of the test and what the outcome could be with the test um, and for the 
um, investigation. And once you're clear about that, you should offer the test. Um, so um, it, it will be what I'd say generally to say it shouldn't be a barrier. There shouldn't be a pushback. It shouldn't be a dismissive consultation because you just push men for the back. Um, so yeah, that's that's my advice. Yeah, and, and thank you. And and from um, our perspective, you know, the nurses, when we speak to people who might be having a bit of pushback, you know, um, or, or maybe having um, having issues with getting a PSA blood test, often there is a reason why maybe the, the GP you know, isn't isn't giving it, and it's a really good idea to have that conversation just to to rule out. You know, if there is a reason why they're not having it, if they still find that you know you are uh, finding kind of it, it difficult to get it despite being informed and everything, you, you know, we often tell men to to mention the the prostate cancer risk management program, and that you know the the kind of right they have for every man over the age of 50 to go ahead and have that PSA blood test um, and, and 45 for the higher risk categories the, the, the categories we're talking about today um, I think we, we have a question there that's talking about the PSA test in, in general and it, it's mentioning um, from um, one of the attendees how, how frequently somebody in the higher risk categories should be having that PSA test I wonder, do, do you want to take that one Bon Mier? Um I think that's a, a lot that we're still kind of learning about, about prostate cancer and, and how the test, how frequent the test should be. The, the transform um, uh, program will be huge and massive. Um, I would say generally, if there is an increased risk, and again, it's going back to that a family history, especially if you're having brother and, and father um, uh, or, or black ethnic minority group and, and those with the BRCA gene, um, uh, then I, I wouldn't um, object to them having a test annually. Um, the trigger for a, a lot of GPs that are experienced around prostate cancer is also that baseline, that first PSA test. So again, the first PSA test may be normal, but usually if it's above a certain level um, for those clinicians quite experienced with prostate cancer, um, they want to kind of check a bit more frequently. Um, if it's a very, very low figure and there's no risk factors, um, then definitely you, you can wait even five years but remember, if the man comes back, it's this thing about it's the man's choice. If the man comes back and says, do you know what, doc? I want a PSA test. Then you shouldn't be refusing. Yeah. yeah. And 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 it's it's about is, you know, from our conversations as well, it's it's about obviously the the man that been been as informed as he can be, but also maybe having that real kind of conversation with the GP where they may be way up well actually maybe a year to two years is reasonable for me to have that test potentially with my pretend with my risk factors you know taken into account because we don't have guidelines that's the trouble you know there is no guideline there to say how often someone should have that PSA blood test if we had a guideline of course we, we you know we could shout it but we don't so it is very much about trying to have those conversations between the man and the GP to work out what's best you know for them um I just uh, want to touch on something. There's quite a few questions coming in um, talking about BPH or, or benign prostate hyperplasia and, um, and and its connection to prostate cancer, or if there is any. And maybe I'll just take this one just to say that, you know, we from from what we know, um, having an enlarged prostate doesn't make you more at risk of having prostate cancer. And so it is very often the case that men get an enlarged prostate as they get older, that their prostate gets bigger the older they get, you know. And so it's very common that men will have urinary symptoms, for example, or, you know, issues with their prostate that is not related to prostate cancer. But having an enlarged prostate does not make you more at risk of prostate cancer. And I just want to reiterate that now, just because I think there is quite a few questions coming in on that um, in through the, the Q&A box. Um, I just I think I have one for the panel. 
So this is for maybe for everyone. I'm not sure who wants to take it, but it's mentioning, is it misleading to tell men that they don't need to have a DRE to have diagnosis if some GPs are still doing them? It says, should we inform men that they have the right to turn down a DRE if it's a big barrier or a fear for them and to ask for the blood test and MRI scan instead? Um, and this this person has said they found uh, I have found it to be a big barrier for men. I can just pick that one up. I, I think it's a really good point. And we know that practice does change a bit around the country. What we're trying to do is make sure that GPs understand the evidence around how useful or not useful it is as a test. So we had a paper published in the British Journal of GPs, which is the kind of top GP medical journal explaining why it's not a good test for prostate cancer. Um, And we have been working with some of the bodies who produce guidelines for GPs to really emphasize that message. And we're hopeful that the NICE guidance will change and that kind of changes that whole framework for GPs. But but the point that they make around you can refuse uh, having a rectal exam is absolutely true. You know, if you go and speak to your GP and they say, well, I'd like to do a rectal exam, you are completely within your rights. Firstly, to ask them why, because there might be a legitimate reason why they want to do that test. But also, you know, you are not under any obligation to have that test. You can say, actually, I'd rather just have the blood test. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and sorry. I would echo what um, Amy said. Um, uh, really, you're not under any obligation. There would be certain reasons why the GP would want to check the, the prostate. If you're talking purely prostate cancer, you can refuse. Um, and, and I think with the write-up in the uh, uh, GP journal, I think a lot more GPs uh, uh, kind of, there would be more understanding of that um, to say, well, okay, yeah, we we'll go for the test first and then and, and just see what happens. So it might be that the test comes back normal um, and maybe you're, you've got significant risk and, and for some reason or you've got symptoms um, and then after a normal test, the GP then offers to say, let's just check, maybe it's the size or it, or if we can feel anything there. But, but surely um, before, before having a test, a PSA test, uh, you, you, you can definitely refuse one. Thank you, um, Amy and 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 Bumi, and we are kind of coming to the end. We're we're running out of time for questions, I'm afraid. Um, but if you do have any more questions, you can always get in touch with my team, the specialist nurses, and um, we're going to have um some uh, information about how to contact us shared in the chat again. I think very soon. Um, but yeah, that that was excellent questions and, and answers, and and I know that there are lots more, um, out there. So please do get in touch and, and we can answer them for you. Um, I'm just um, going to kind of move on to some of the, the closing up points just because we are coming up to time on an hour. Um, thank you to all of our panel. Thank you so much for, for being today and for, for everything that you have um, discussed and all the information that you've passed on and to everyone for attending. And just a reminder to anyone who hasn't already, if they want to share, um, take and share the risk checker. Um, for those of you that have done it already, thank you so much, but we will share the link in the chat just now. Um, I also want to mention our amazing OMAZE partnership. Um, it's, uh, it's a tongue twister, our amazing partnership <laughs> with Omaze. Um, enter the Omaze prize draw this June to be in with a chance to win an incredible house in Surrey worth 3 million and help fund our biggest and most ambitious trial to increase early diagnosis and make screening program a reality. We're going to have a link shared in the chat now so you can read a lot more about this as well. Um, I am, Ian mentioned it, but just to say again, we have a life-saving conversations webinar run by our volunteer team on Thursday, the 25th of July. And if you want to um, join this, there will be a link shared now so that you can register for that. If I can ask, if, if possible, 
for you to take a few moments to complete a couple of feedback polls to help better our webinars. So the answers will all be anonymous. There will be an opportunity for you to share further feedback and ideas in a, in a post event survey, which will be emailed out to everyone tomorrow. Um, but we just want to get uh, to know more of our audience today. And so that if we are to do more webinars in the future, hopefully we can improve on them. Um, so if you want to select what um, what relates to you, that would be brilliant. Okay, I think um, we have one more poll uh, also, if, if you can please answer, that would be brilliant. I think we're coming to an end. Just to say again, thank you so much to everyone and I hope you have a lovely evening. Take care.